Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on IFRS in the United States brought to you by McConley and Asbury. Today's speakers will be Janice Snyder of McConley and Asbury. If you have any technical difficulties or feedback during the webinar, please use the built-in chat function in the webinar software to send us a message. Also, please submit questions during the webinar as well and we will answer those questions either during the webinar or at the end if we have enough time. We will be posting the slides from today's presentation on our blog at www.macpas.com slash manews. Look for that post to be up by the end of the day tomorrow. You will be receiving CPE credit for attending this one hour webinar. CPE certifications will be sent out via email within the next week. So without further ado, here is Janice Snyder. Thank you, Reed. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janice Snyder, and we're going to spend the next 50 minutes or so talking about uh, International Financial Reporting Standards, or IFRS, in the U.S. For today's agenda, we're going to cover what is IFRS, a brief history of IFRS, a little bit about the SEC and IFRS and what they're working on right now. We're going to talk about how that interplays with the private company financial reporting standards and what their future might be and then talk about some of the FASB and International Accounting Standard Board joint projects. Uh, the next slide is a brief disclaimer. It basically says I'm not the FASB, I'm not the IASB, I'm not going to pretend to be either one of those, but I am a licensed CPA and I do have extensive experience working with the International Financial Reporting Standards as well as auditing several companies over the past 12 years. And the last of our introductory slides is a little bit of information about me. As I mentioned, my name is Janice Snyder. I'm a CPA. I've been working in the profession for several years. I've worked for an international firm as well as now working for a regional firm. Um, and I still enjoy public accounting. All right, moving on to the first point of our agenda. What is IFRS? What is IFRS? As noted here, the International Financial Reporting Standards are a high quality, comprehensive, globally accepted set of accounting standards. As noted, IFRS contains many similar concepts to US GAAP, but don't let that fool you. There are a lot of differences as you dive into the details and a lot of nuances and a lot of words and phrases that can mean something different in IFRS than they would mean in US GAAP. The next thing to keep in mind about IFRS is that IFRS is a much less extensive body of literature. There are thousands and thousands of pages of US GAAP guidance out there, and this little picture I've provided you here is all of the guidance that currently exists under the International Financial Reporting Standards. Now, those of us who are used to US GAAP um, tend to find this a little bit disconcerting. There is limited industry-specific guidance, um, less detailed application guidance, and it's much more um, principles-based on IFRS. They have fewer specific rules, although there are limited areas where they can be more restrictive than U.S. GAAP. There are more circumstances where application of IFRS will require the exercise of judgment, and the big theory behind IFRS is disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. So you have contemporaneous analysis and documentation as well as extensive disclosures. The average set of IFRS financials can be two to three times in length what a set of US GAAP financials would be. Moving on to some of the key concepts of IFRS. IFRS offers many choices, choices that have to be made in the first year of adoption, which may include whether to apply something retrospectively or prospectively, or things that would need to be changed on a go forward basis. You also have to look at new transactions as your company changes and enters into new things that may be affected by the policy choices that you have made. So you're constantly evaluating those choices under IFRS, choices that you would not have under US GAAP. As I mentioned previously, IFRS requires significantly more disclosures than US GAAP. So be prepared for the extensive footnotes and also for telling the reader about all those choices that you've made under IFRS. One thing to emphasize here is the fair presentation of the financial statements prevails when you're talking about these standards. Fair presentation comes above everything else in IFRS, and if you have a transaction where the standards would not lead you to a fair presentation of that transaction, IFRS, in limited circumstances, would actually require you to deviate 
from the written standards and fully disclose that. Just as a quick side note, um, IFRS net income was accelerated at many companies compared to U.S. GAAP net income. And there are various choices that can be made that drive that, that would include things such as LIFO, pension accounting, inventory reserves, and other decisions that your company would make that would be legitimate decisions under IFRS that U.S. GAAP would not permit you to make. So I've mentioned some of the other differences with U.S. GAAP from a high level, such as industry-specific guidance, concepts, terminologies, scope, and effective dates of those standards. So just some of those things to keep in mind as we move forward through the presentation. Now that I've given you a five minute introduction on what IFRS is, I'd like to give you a brief history of IFRS so you can understand how long the standards have been around, the global move towards these international standards, and how this might ultimately impact you and your company. As we begin discussing the history of IFRS, I go back to 1973 when the International Accounting Standards Committee was formed. I'm sometimes surprised when I hear individuals say the international standards have not been around long enough and that a lot of countries have not had exposure to them. They were actually formed in the same year that the FASB in the U.S. was formed. With that being said, I'm going to skip forward to 2001 because that's when the international standards really started gaining some recognition when the European Union passed regulation to adopt IFRS for all of its listed entities. Then in 2002, the FASB and the IASB signed the Norwalk Agreement which was the first of many agreements over the next nine years in which they committed to reducing differences between U.S. GAAP and IFRS. These were the first discussions around conversion. So once again, when people say IFRS is new, our country's been talking about this for the last nine years. Then in 2005, IFRS gained a lot of momentum. The listed entities in Europe finally adopted IFRS, and then Australia went and adopted IFRS. And you'll note on these slides, that there are some differences in IFRS around the globe. That the European Union adopted IFRS as approved by the European Union, which is slightly different than pure IFRS as approved by the International Accounting Standards Board. And when Australia adopted, they went with IFRS as approved by the Australian government, and they have certain carve-outs for financial instruments that deviate them from the pure international standards. New Zealand also adopted IFRS in 2005, as approved by the New Zealand government. So once again, other small nuances were in place. And South Africa adopted IFRS in 2005 as approved by the IASB. Moving on to 2006, we see the FASB and the IASB released a memorandum of understanding and identified some more of their short-term and long-term goals in regards to convergence between the U.S. GAAP and the international standards. They believed that they needed some real steps and some milestones in this progress because not too much had happened since they signed their 2002 agreement. The International Accounting Standards Board was a little busy helping the EU adopt and they really hadn't focused on this and the U.S. wasn't pushing that forward at the time either. So as we move forward from that, we see that in 2007, China decided to take the accounting law of the People's Republic of China and substantially converge that with IFRS. So they set a plan to say, over time, we're going to make the accounting law of the People's Republic of China consistent with the international standards. And at the end of 2007, the SEC made a large step saying, we're going to permit foreign private issuers that have to file their quarterly and annual reports with the SEC to file only under IFRS. They even went further than that and said, you do not have to reconcile between IFRS and U.S. GAAP income. So a lot of international entities were very pleased that they no longer had to keep books in, under both standards. Now we move into 2008, and the SEC says, we need to really get serious about this. So they put out a roadmap for potential mandatory adoption of IFRS for U.S. filers. They set a timeline out there with a goal of the year 2014. They figured, well, that's six years away, and we have a lot of time to work on convergence and move in that direction and attempt to set that goal for all of our U.S. filers. So the Memorandum of Understanding between the IASB and the FASB was updated once again. So in 2009, we look to other areas of the globe and we say, well, what's going on there? And in 2009, most of South America adopted IFRS and they adopted pure IFRS as approved by the IASB. 
In 2009, once again, the IASB and the FASB reaffirmed their commitment to conversion. And the last item I want to note there is that the IASB released IFRS for small and medium-sized entities in 2009. That actually was effective that year, and it was the first time that there was a true global standard for companies that were defined as being non-publicly accountable entities. So if you do not have public debt, public bonds, you're not a bank or an insurance company, and certain other definitions under IFRS, you are permitted to follow these abbreviated standards. These standards are about 230 pages long and are designed to be a comprehensive set of literature solely targeted at what they call small and medium-sized entities, or also referred to as SMEs. Moving on to 2010, Brazil adopts IFRS as approved by the Brazilian government, and then the SEC starts becoming more active in their efforts on IFRS. So in February 2010, the SEC issued a statement in support of convergence to a high-quality, globally accepted accounting standard. In April of 2010, they released a work plan for the consideration of incorporating IFRS into the U.S. financial reporting system, and it addresses six key concepts and six key issues I'll touch on a bit later that the SEC is very concerned about, should we say, let's move the U.S. fully to the international standards. In August of 2010, there was a solic solicitation of public comment on incorporating IFRS for U.S. issuers. So they really wanted to understand what were the concerns of the market and what is what are the investors worried about as we move forward with this potential plan. In December 2010, the SEC Chairman Mary Shapiro indicated that companies need a minimum of four years to convert to IFRS. Well, some companies at this point breathed a sigh of relief because this, this tentative date of 2014 was hanging out there up to this point. But if you understand IFRS and how you have to go back several years to have three years of comparative financial statements, which would also be required by the SEC, you would know that 2014 would require 2012 comparative information, and that's just not sufficient time for the U.S. public markets to adjust to that. So there was some good news in that SEC announcement for many companies. All right, I know this timeline's getting kind of long, but here's where I think it really starts to get interesting. The next few slides are the current information that's impacting us, what's happening in 2011, and what we expect for 2012 and going forward. So in 2011, Mexico, Singapore, and South Korea adopted IFRS, as approved by the IASB. Canada also adopted IFRS, but the interesting thing about Canada adopting the international standards is that they provided private companies with the choice of using accounting standards for private entities or full IFRS. Canada said, we do not like IFRS for small and medium-sized entities, so we're going to go with our own accounting standards, which is essentially Canadian GAAP. As a result of that, Canada has kept Canadian GAAP intact and still utilizes that for most of their private companies. On November 7th of this year, just a few days ago, the new European Union directives could cut financial reporting requirements for small and medium-sized entities and block the use of the international standards. So this information is a little bit conflicting at this point. We were on a path where the small and medium-sized standards were a great alternative for private entities. But now Germany and France in particular have come out and said, well, wait a second, we still think we like our local gap. And they may do what Canada has done and choose their local gap as the standard for, small and, for their small and medium-sized entities. We'll have to watch that one closely and see what the rest of Europe will do, as well as how that may impact the U.S. and our private companies. As we continue to look at 2012, we turn to see what the SEC is doing. The SEC is working diligently to finalize their work plan in order to assist them in to making a decision as to whether or not the U.S. should incorporate IFRS into their markets. On May 26, the SEC released a white paper proposing a model that they call condorsement. And yes, the SEC did make up a new word with that. Um, they decided that we would not completely endorse IFRS and sort of flip a switch and say this is now what the U.S. is going to follow. They also thought, well, we could converge, but that takes a very, very long time, and it's a very steady process that we've been going through for at least the last three years. So let's go with condorsement. Let's try to merge these two models 
and see how we can bring them together by continuing our convergence efforts while endorsing standards when there are certain ones that the FASB agrees with. Their approach also said, let's put a defined timeline on this and let's get us all working together towards the same model. Now the approach did not, at this point, put a specific timeline out other than to say, oh, perhaps five to seven years. By the end of this year, or by December 31st, the SEC has said they will announce their official decision on what should happen with IFRS in the U.S. So we can all wait for that big announcement, probably on December 30th, to see what the SEC has decided for our markets. At the same time, the IASB and the FASB are working together to complete several of their major projects and they still have some goals of completing some of those by the end of this year, although the majority of them have been postponed into 2012. Just as a side note, the AICPA and many big four firms have come out publicly as very strong supporters of giving U.S. public com companies the option to adopt IFRS, that we should not hold our markets back, and if we do have international entities that may be at a disadvantage having to convert their financial information into U.S. GAAP, that they should be able to file under IFRS, should they so choose. Hans Hugervos, the new chairman of the IASB, says it will be economically beneficial for the U.S. to adopt IFRS. So you see a lot of entities coming together trying to push the SEC in this direction, although the SEC has not given out any indication of their decision other than their white paper proposing endorsement. Now we can move on to 2012 and start looking forward a little bit. We know that India is converging with IFRS, as well as Japan. Now they've had many adjustments to their timelines and many discussions about if they're going to fully converge or partially converge, and Japan is actually choosing some deviations from IFRS and turning towards IFRS as approved by the Financial Services Agency of Japan. Um, but they are moving in that direction. They, they do have plans to converge. In 2012, the U.S. should also have a path forward, whether that's to move forward with IFRS or potentially not, although all the indicators are that we're moving in the direction of IFRS. As we look to 2012 and 2014, that's a possible early adoption period for U.S. filers, as well as potential effective dates of many of the converged standards, which I'll talk about towards the end of this presentation. This next slide is really just a nice picture of the globe and IFRS. It tells you which countries have adopted or converged, when they've adopted or converged, and the one country that has not made a decision at this point, which is the United States. So by the end of 2011, we will know what the United States path is going forward, and that will be the last major economic country that has not announced their plans in regards to IFRS. Now that we've taken a look at the history of IFRS and we've looked at where the rest of the world is in regards to their decision-making pro process, let's turn to the SEC and see what they're doing in regards to IFRS and what challenges they're facing as they make this important decision. As we begin looking at the SEC, we look to their work plan and the six key items that they're focusing on as they make their decision on how the U.S. will move forward on IFRS. They are to announce their key decisions and their conclusions from this work plan by December 2010, so stay tuned for that. Within the work plan, there are six key areas. The first of those is sufficient development and application of IFRS. They are concerned about, is IFRS comprehensive enough? Is it auditable? Is it enforceable? And one of their larger concerns is, will it actually diminish comparability across jurisdictions due to their less prescriptive guidance? So they're diving into these items and trying to conclude on whether or not the U.S. can truly rely on the IFRS standards. The second item is the independence of the standard setting board. They're looking at the oversight of the IFRS Foundation, the composition of the Foundation, as well as the IASB, and how these entities are funded. There is some concern over funding in the future and how they're going to keep these to be truly independent, viable entities, and who's going to pay the cost for these entities. And the last item is investor understanding and education regarding IFRS. They're concerned about U.S. investors and their current familiarity with IFRS, although many recent studies have shown that about 70% of U.S. investors have at least some knowledge of IFRS. The big question is, what does that sum actually mean? And if they're not fully educated, how can we get them to be more educated? 
As we continue to item number four of the SEC work plan, we look at how the U.S. regulatory environment would be affected by a change to IFRS. The most significant of those items listed there for anyone that uses LIFO is that LIFO is expressly prohibited under IFRS. If a company uses LIFO for tax purposes, they are required to use LIFO for book purposes under current tax laws. Since LIFO would no longer be permitted, IFRS could be a significant change to your tax liabilities when you cannot incorporate that LIFO calculation. Number five looks at the impact on issuers, and such, such as changes to their accounting systems, your contractual agreements, your debt agreements that might reference U.S. GAAP, as well as corporate governance, litigation contingencies, and not to mention the increased cost that is likely to result from the adoption of IFRS. Item number six is human capital readiness, and what the SEC wants to know is do we have the education and training in the U.S. to incorporate IFRS, and do we have auditor capacity to conduct the audits in accordance with IFRS? As the SEC concludes on their work plan, they'll look at the different methods of incorporating IFRS. They'll look to convergence, which is continue the process that we're going through at this time to slowly make U.S. GAAP more consistent with IFRS. They can look to endorsement, which would be where the U.S. would simply accept the IFRS standards as they stand today and say, yes, this will become our new standard of accounting. Or, as I mentioned before, the SEC put out a preference towards endorsement, which is a combination approach of those two. Let's take a look at what endorsement actually means. It means that we would see IFRS infused into U.S. GAAP over a set period of time by endorsing the international standards one at a time, which will be done through the FASB, while converging IFRS and U.S. GAAP through current efforts that are being done today. U.S. GAAP would continue to exist, which would be great for a lot of those legal documents and debt agreements and many other things that refer to U.S. GAAP, while the FASB and the IASB continue to work on other projects. For areas not on the IASB and FASB agenda, the FASB would work standard by standard to address each one of those and see if they make sense to converge them into U.S. GAAP. It was stated in the SEC white paper that incorporation of IFRS through the framework would have the objective of achieving the goal of having a single set of high quality, globally accepted accounting standards, while doing so in a practical manner that could minimize both the cost and effort needed to incorporate IFRS into the financial reporting system. So that's at least the theory. They're trying to consider all the parties involved, and we'll have to see how that may actually play out when the SEC makes their announcement at the end of this year. Moving on to the next item on our agenda, we have private company financial reporting. I think many of you on this webinar are private companies, so this should be some of the most relevant information to you. In regards to private company financial reporting, there's been much discussion over the last 10 years as to whether or not this would be appropriate for the U.S. But now we need to look at trends of what's happening with IFRS for SMEs, decisions on Canada to retain their local gap for private entities, and potentially other decisions within the European Union to say we really do believe we need private standards for our private companies. In the U.S., particular standards that have been looked at for a private company perspective are noting that some of the most difficult, costly, and cumbersome to implement standards are the ones that have the least amount of meaning for private companies, and they're listed here as the variable interest entities, uncertain tax positions, and fair value measurements have been items that have been cited as being the most difficult standards and the least relevant. So at this point in time, momentum is building to move the U.S. towards private company financial reporting standards. In the U.S., we can look back to 2006 when the private company financial reporting committee was formed and Judith O'Dell was appointed as the chair of that committee. In 2010, the Blue Ribbon Panel on Standard Setting for Private Companies was formed. And in July of 2010, the Blue Ribbon Panel came out publicly and said, we believe we need separate gap for private companies. Well, this was great news for the Private Company and Financial Reporting Committee, and they said, yes, we agree, and we think that should happen as well. So in October of 2010, a significant majority of the Blue Ribbon Panel voted to recommend a new model of financial reporting for private companies, including a recommendation to establish a step separate standard setting board. Now, they did meet in December of 2010, 
as well as again in March of 2011 to lay out a plan to say what would this board look like, how would it be structured, and how would it be funded. On January 14, 2011, Daryl Buck became a board member of the FASB, and this was the first FASB board member to truly represent private company financial reporting perspectives. In July 2011, the FASB released a decision-making framework for private companies, and in October of 2011, the Financial Accounting Foundation requested comments on its plan to establish a private company standards improvement council that they believe may replace the current private company financial reporting committee. They're anticipating a new standard setting model that follows GAAP with exceptions for private companies, and they will announce their action plan for that by the end of this year. The one question that I have, though, is that these private company boards have decided that they should not lead the, the initiative on IFRS. So will the SEC's decision on incorporation of IFRS in the U.S. have an effect on private companies and these private company initiatives? As we move on in our agenda, we're going to spend some time talking about some technical updates from the FASB and IASB joint projects. As some of you may know, the FASB and the IASB have been very busy over the last two years as they work to converge standards between IFRS and U.S. GAAP. There's been many issues and many points where they've had significant disagreements on, and they've worked over time to resolve as many of those items as possible. The first item mentioned here, Revenue Recognition, had over 900 comment letters on it when it was first released. They are expecting this will require retrospective application, which poses some difficulty of going back three years to get your revenue to be properly stated in accordance with the new standards. We are expecting a new exposure draft in the fourth quarter of 2011, which I've heard that's been released internally at the FASB, but it has not been released to the public as of the time of this webcast. It is expected, though, that this standard will not be effective until at least 2015 in order to give companies plenty of time to react to these changes. Hopefully by now you've heard about leases. These have been being discussed since at least 2004, and I've been hearing that leases are coming onto our balance sheet since not long after Enron occurred, and the way things stand right now is that will be happening in the near future. They are anticipating that this will require require a type of simplified retrospective accounting. And since the original uh, exposure draft had over 2,800 comment letters, they are putting this back out to be re-exposed after addressing some of the concerns in those original comment letters. So you will see that in 2012. They do not know when leases are anticipated to be effective. Financial instruments has actually been quite a challenge between the two boards, and they've broken this into three independent projects where they're looking at classification and measurement of financial instruments, impairment of the financial instruments, as well as hedge accounting, in an attempt, and hopefully they will be successful, to simplify hedge accounting. They do expect that these standards will be applied retrospectively, but given the, the frequency of their meetings and the length of the discussions at this point, it's not known when the final standard will be effective. The next item is balance sheet offsetting. Balance sheet offsetting, um, there are some different rules between IFRS and U.S. GAAP in this area, and as a general rule of thumb, there are much fewer things netted in IFRS as there are in U.S. GAAP. So there would be some changes to the presentation of our balance sheet and potentially some grossing up of the balance sheet there. And we expect the final standard to be released in the fourth quarter of 2011 and potentially be effective in 2013. The last one to mention is a consolidation standard. And the exposure draft has been released and it is out for comment right now. And you have till the end of January if you'd like to take a look at that and respond. Now keep in mind I've highlighted five of the more significant FASB IASB joint projects and we'll be going through them in a little more detail, but these do not encompass all of the projects that are out there as they've been working together extensively over several years. Now the next slide I'm giving you a snapshot of some key items being worked on by the FASB. Now there is other comprehensive income that has been put out there as an exposure draft that is anticipated to be finalized any day now and we do expect that will be effective in 2012. 
Testing Goodwill for Impairment was a FASB only project and that has been completed and was issued and I will give you the details of what they've decided in that in just a few minutes. Impairment of indefinite lived intangibles is not finished, but they do expect it will look very similar to the testing of goodwill for impairment and the changes that they've made there, and they do still expect to have an exposure draft out by the end of 2011. Investment property is a FASB only project because the FASB appears to be coming in line with the IASB on this standard in that investment property would be recorded at fair value. And the definitions that they're working on with this would align it so the IASB would not require any revisions to their existing standards. The first project we'll talk about is revenue recognition. This is a significant project of the FASB and the IASB. It, the first exposure draft was issued in June of 2010 and it was open for public comment through October. During that period of time, there was significant public feedback with over 900 comment letters, and nearly 25% of those comment letters came from the construction industry, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Due to the magnitude of the comments and the widespread concerns over what was coming through in the exposure draft, the FASB will reissue this standard uh, potentially any day now. It has been released internally, I've been told, at the FASB by one of their managers, but um, as of the time of this webcast, it has not been re released to the public. The goal of this revenue recognition um, standard is to replace the existing literature with its numerous industry-specific components that we have in US GAAP where we have many standards written just for one industry and replace it with one single principles-based model for revenue recognition. So based upon the decisions reached to date by the FASB and the IASB, I'll start with the good news. The good news is that revenue determination is likely to be very similar to what you're doing in current practice although it won't be identical, and, and the bad news to that is the way you get there may be a little bit different, how you look at these transactions and how you separate these transactions and how you look at the different components. So one of the key provisions of the expected revenue draft is that non-public entities should disaggregate revenue between performance obligations satisfied at a point in time and performance obligations that are satisfied over time and that will drive how you recognize the revenue from those items. Certain criteria exist to assess whether control transfers over time or at a point in time will require a lot of judgment and you certainly see in this standard the judgment, judgment, judgment that is required in IFRS as well as some of the disclosures that will be required as part of that. The final standard is expected to clarify that the objective of measuring progress is to de depict the vendor's performance, and it's not always appropriate to use a cost-to-cost -cost model. Um, IFRS does believe in the matching principle, but they don't emphasize it as much as US GAAP would, so in some cases this standard could lead to a disconnect on a principle that we've always held up as the matching principle between revenue and expenses. So we'll have to see where the ultimate standard comes out on this one. There are a few changes from the initial exposure draft that we expect to see in the final exposure draft. And the first one of those includes segmenting contracts. We believe you'll no longer be required to segment one contract into two or more contracts, although there will still be some requirements to bundle or combine multiple contracts when certain conditions are met. The second item that we expect to see a change based upon what the FASB and IASB have put out to date is separate performance obligations. We expect them to clarify and modify um, when you can bundle multiple promised goods and services and this is huge for the construction industry. There was much difficulty over whether how you transfer ownership when you're building a building or building a bridge and what your deliverables were at various points in time and how that would drive revenue recognition and how you make it very different answers from what we have today. So they've spent a fair amount of time focusing on the feedback from the construction industry and what this will mean to them and how we can clarify those performance obligations and how they, they translate into revenue in regards to the standard. Um, we expect them to be clarifying multiple items in regards to transaction price and how you determine that transaction price and the elements that will go into that decision making process as well as certain items surrounding onerous contracts and certain accruals and things that would need to be made in relation to that.
We, they have also said that incremental costs to obtain a contract may be able to be recognized on the balance sheet as an asset as long as they are separately disclosed and given their own line item and they meet certain criteria. So that is a change from some of the existing literature. And they're also clarifying certain warranty related quality assurances that they should be accrued when revenue is recognized rather than deferring some of that revenue. So certainly some changes coming down, some of them pretty good, a lot of them in response to those numerous comment letters that have come in on that standard. So there's a lot of things that we expect to change in the new exposure draft, and there are some things that we do not expect to change. And this includes the retrospective adoption of this standard. It would apply to all contracts, verbal or written, that were in existence in any of the periods presented, even if those contracts were completed before the year of adoption. So it will require a significant effort for companies to go back, take a look at those contracts, take a look at that revenue, and make sure they've recognized it appropriately under the existing standards. And then we expect an effective date of no earlier than 2015 on this standard, as they've come out and said that companies need plenty of time to prepare to implement these changes. As Reed mentioned earlier, if you have any questions on any of these items, I know some of these more technical topics towards the end can be a little bit more challenging. So please don't hesitate to send in your questions, and I'll answer as many of those as I can at, at the end of the webcast. So moving on to leases. The initial exposure draft was issued in August of 2010, and to say this generated substantial feedback is an understatement. There were 2,800 comment letters received on this leasing standard. Um, much, much concern in the industry over bringing essentially all of your leases onto the balance sheet. I think there was quite a bit of shock about the time and effort and energy involved in this um, and also how it's going to impact all the companies, their debt covenants, their ratios, their earnings, and their EBITDA calculations. So if you have not heard of this standard to date, you're going to hear about it today because it's so, so significant. The average exposure draft gets about 100, 150 comment letters. So to know that 20 800 um, companies, individuals, special interest groups chimed in on this is just astounding. So there's general support in those comment letters for placing leases on the balance sheet, but concerns about the complexities in the calculation. And now that every little lease you enter into, you have an asset and you have an obligation and you have to calculate the interest on that and you have to amortize your right to use that asset and it gets very complicated. There are also a lot of concerns there about the lesser side of accounting, and there were some challenges there to make sure that the lesser side of the accounting in this exposure draft aligns with the revenue recognition exposure draft that's going to be put out. So the FASB expects to issue uh, or to reissue the exposure draft and put a new one out for comment in 2012, and their target date is in the first half of the year. So the tentative changes that we expect from this exposure draft coming out is that we will now have financing leases, which look a lot like a capital lease. And these will be leases that typically have a term of more than a year and meet certain other criteria, but it will be the majority of your leases. And then there will be a criteria for an other than finance lease. And this does not include a financing element, so it results in a pattern of profit and loss similar to current operating leases. However, you're still going to have an asset and liability on the balance sheet. It just affects where your expense goes on your income statement. So we're going to spend a little bit more time on this on the next few slides. There are a few other changes that we expect to see in the new exposure draft on leases. And the first one is that in the previous exposure draft, there was the inclusion of the longest term that was more likely than not to occur. So this got really kind of sticky of if I'm entering into a 10-year lease with five extension options, what is more likely than not to occur? Is that 15 years, 20 years, or 25 years? And you'd really have to look at that and try to break down where exactly should I be ending up and what is the life of this lease? Well, the new exposure draft will include non-cancelable terms plus any option period for which exercise is reasonably certain. So if you enter into that 10-year lease today and you really don't know if you're going to extend it for another 5, 10, or 15 years when those renewal options come, you look to what you only record that when it is reasonably certain. 
Also, the initial exposure draft required consideration of lessee specific factors such as history, intentions, you know, have you established a pattern of behave behavior, as well as economic factors in making the determination. But the new exposure draft is expecting you to only look at required economic factors. So if you're in a lease that's significantly below market or if there's significant economic benefit to you extending that lease, then it would ask you to look only at those economic factors. So that was a very big, I guess, win if it comes out this way as final for all the individuals that were sending in their comment letters with concern over this particular point. Other tentative changes include variable payments. The initial exposure draft required projected rate or an index rate, where the new exposure draft is telling you to use the current rate. So you don't have to go through projecting what your interest rates may be at that point in time and what it's more likely to come out at. You can use your current rate. And then lessor accounting issues are expected to be addressed through this as well but I could probably spend a whole hour on lessor accounting, so we're not going to get into the details of that at this point, just to note that we're hopeful that there will be some significant changes in the lessor accounting model. Now I'm just going to take a moment to take a closer look at the lessee accounting side of this. Based upon the previous exposure draft and all the comments by the FASB and IASB to date, the balance sheet side of what was pre previously proposed will not change. You'll record a new asset on your balance sheet for your right to use the leased item. This will be recorded at the same amount as your liability, which will be recorded as an obligation to pay future rentals, and that will be the net present value of those lease payments. So whether you have a finance lease or an other than finance lease, it will be recorded on your balance sheet. Where they have decided to deviate from what was proposed in the previous standard is that we now have a finance lease and an other than finance lease. And for a finance lease, straight line rent expense would be replaced by amortization and interest expense for lessees within their current um, income statement. This would result in acceleration of the expense because you will have greater interest expense on your debt in earlier periods than you will in later periods. The second impact of this is that it would increase EBITDA for any of, of you whose debt covenants or bank agreements rely upon EBITDA as a key measure in your debt covenant calculations, so you'll be taking an operating expense of rent and replacing it with amortization and interest. For an other than finance lease, it is expected that the income statement treatment will remain very similar to current accounting practice and that you will have an operating expense associated with those other than finance leases. Okay, so leases and revenue are a lot to take in. There's a lot going on there. But now as we move on, probably the third of the the projects that is one of the more significant projects is financial instruments and I'm going to say very little about the financial instruments because as I mentioned before it's being broken down into several projects and while we did have an exposure draft out there with comment periods that have closed they're continuing to take specific feedback and ask questions on items like hedge accounting and on impairment and they're still assessing did we get classification and measurement correct so a lot of things are changing within these standards and there's still a lot of debate around the financial instruments and what's being proposed. So the last official proposals that were out there between the FASB and the IASB was that the FASB was proposing that all financial instruments in the scope of the project be measured at fair value with limited exceptions. Now the IASB does move more towards fair value more quickly than the FASB has. So this was a positive move in the, in the FASB moving closer to the IASB. So with more financial instruments being recorded at fair value, um, a lot of those changes in fair value will be going through income. So it adds a lot of volatility to the income. And there will be fewer investments that will qualify for the equity method. But as I said, these, these things are still being discussed and a lot of items are still changing surrounding financial instruments. There are a few things within the financial instrument standards that we are hopeful will not change. And one is that they put out there that non-public entities with assets less than $1 billion will be granted an additional four years to measure their loans at fair value. So while they have been talking about moving loans to fair value, and there's been much debate over that, they have at least said that non-public entities will have additional time to address that. <laughs> 
In April 2011, they did make some tentative decisions as well to have individuals classify financial instruments according to their business strategy. And this was pretty significant for them to come out and say, there's going to be some choices, which will of course require much disclosure to let the readers know why you've classified them in this manner, but that you will have items for amortized cost and items that will be recorded at fair value through other comprehensive income, much like are available for sale securities today, and other items recorded at fair value through net income, where you have instruments held for sale or instruments being actively managed. The one thing that we do know is their intention is that more items will be at fair value and that they will be fair value going through net income. So stay close to this one if you have significant financial instruments on your financial statements. Um, pay attention to what's going on but it is changing every day so a week after I give this presentation the information might be outdated so just keep that in mind. All right, I've touched on the three most significant um, convergence projects, so I'll go through the last few items rather quickly. Balance sheet offsetting. What you need to know is that IFRS does not offset nearly as many items as US GAAP does, and there were several items on the table to move US GAAP closer to IFRS. Uh, but IFRS has actually moved a little bit closer to U.S. as well. And the one thing we know to date is that the FASB decided to retain existing GAAP guidance for anything that is non-derivative instruments and that they're just going to require additional disclosures beginning in 2013. Moving on to consolidation, there was an exposure draft released on November 3rd and comments are due by January 17th. And this has this is addressing certain issues surrounding principal versus agent. So these criteria would affect the evaluation of whether an entity is a variable interest entity, and if so, whether the reporting entity should consolidate the entity being evaluated. So they're going to take you through certain decisions, and they're going to change a little bit the focus that was on this on what entities have to be consolidated and what do not. So if you're particularly interested in this consolidation standard, you still have the ability to comment up through January 17th. Moving on to the Statement of Comprehensive Income. This was issued in June of 2011, and it is effective for fiscal years ending after December 15, 2012 for non-public entities with earlier adoption requirements for public entities. The purpose is to improve comparability, consistency, and transparency of financial reporting. And it is going to require either a single continuous statement of income and compre other comprehensive income or two separate but consecutive statements. So it does take away the option that a lot of companies had to show this, this OCI component as part of their equity roll forward. But very recently on November 8th, the FASB issued a proposed auditing stand accounting standard update to defer certain portions of this standard. So we'll see if certain of those disclosure requirements as part of this standard actually get delayed. So stay tuned on that one. The next technical update is testing goodwill for impairment. The FASB has decided that a company can now look solely at qualitative factors, document those qualitative factors, and determine that if it's not more likely than not that the fair value is less than the carrying amount, they can stop and they no longer have to do the goodwill and the quantitative goodwill impairment assessment. They can stop with simply the qualitative assessment. Now the goodwill standard is very good news for a lot of companies because they can save a lot of time and cost of hiring an independent third party to do that goodwill impairment calculation. So one of the FASB's next project is to move on to impairment of indefinite lived intangibles. And the theory is the same as the goodwill standard. They're looking to this standard to say if it, you can do a qualitative assessment and determine that it is not more likely than not, that your um, fair value is less than your carrying value, then you can stop. The board decided to exempt non-public entities from the quantitative disclosures about significant unobservable inputs that is part of the current standards after year one has passed. So there's some very good things on the horizon here between goodwill and potentially indefinite lived intangibles that could save some companies some money and not having to hire those third-party specialists. And the last technical update for today, as I'm sure you're all disappointed, um, is investment property. Investment property is defined as property held by the owner or held in a finance lease to earn rentals or for capital appreciation or both. 
This is the definition that the FASB is looking to use and it is the same definition that the IASB uses for their investment property. Your investment property would be required to be measured at fair value and any adjustment to the value of those investment properties would go through opening retained earnings upon adoption. So the goal of the boards is to issue an exposure draft in the second quarter of 2012. So if you have investment property, this could significantly impact you and your earnings on a going forward basis. Okay, that concludes our presentation and now we'll take a moment to answer a few questions. A few of them have been coming in, so I'll start with the first one. The first question I see here is, who opposes IFRS adoption in the U.S.? As I think about that for a moment, um, there are certainly various companies, particularly ones that do not have international operations and do not have to deal with IFRS in other countries have very little exposure, if any, to IFRS at this point. So the learning curve and the training for them, if adoption would be mandatory in the U.S., would be very significant. So a lot of those parties have opposed IFRS adoption. In terms of other individuals that oppose IFRS adoption, the director of NASBA came out this summer and actually said, well, I strongly oppose the incorporation of IFRS in the U.S. Um, for various reasons, which he cited as um, global inconsistencies, the various versions of, of IFRS that are being used around the world. Um, he talked about the lack of governance and independence of the IASB and the cost considerations of adoptions as um, three of his biggest concerns on why we should not adopt IFRS in the U.S. So certainly we still have all the international players coming in saying we should adopt and we should move in that direction and they've been very strongly pushing the U.S. Um, they've actually been cited saying that the U.S. could kill the dream of uniform worldwide standards if we don't move in that direction. The only thing we know right now is that many companies support, including as well as the big four and the AICPA, support the option to adopt IFRS in the U.S. as opposed to saying we think we should force all companies to go in that direction. Okay, I see another question coming in here and it's about um, the private companies. It says, do you know anything about the new standard setting model for private companies? Well, the short answer is no. Um, it's so new, new, we know very little about where the Financial Accounting Foundation might go with this. Um, the one thing they do know is, is that they're looking for a new model to move us in that direction. And I know that they initially were proposing a separate standard setting board, but just this fall, I think the end of October, the Financial Accounting Foundation president came out and said, we're really leaning more towards um, U.S. GAAP with exceptions as opposed to an entirely separate standard setting board. Um, they have said that they think we've learned over history, it's better to have one standard setter and to keep the standards the same as much as possible. Now, as I said before, we're still not sure if the U.S. incorporates IFRS over the long term, what that may mean for this committee and for their plans. But I do know they're trying to make private companies more prevalent and allow them to have more of a voice as the standards are finalized and as they are evolving through the FASB. So looks like maybe not a new board, but a little more prominence placed on the private company standards. Hopefully that answers your question. I don't think I know too much more than most other people would know other than staying on top of the recent press releases and articles that have been out there on this topic. All right, I think we have uh, time for one more question. And I see there's been, been a few questions on leases. And I, I can never get out of a technical update the last several years without talking about leases. So this question is about the, what is the impact of the leasing standards on the financial statements. Um, the new leasing standards, I think as I mentioned earlier, are proposing that you would have an intangible asset on your balance sheet for the net present value of your future payments for your right to use that asset. And you would at the same time record a corresponding liability at that same net present value so you would have an obligation on your financials that looks kind of like debt. You'll have a current piece and a long-term piece for those future payment streams. And then on the income statement side you would have um, 
your straight line rent expense, if it was rent expense in the past, being replaced by amortization and interest expense for anything they consider to be a financing lease. Um, and there's a lot of things that are going to fall into financing leases. So certainly this change is going to increase EBITDA and affect a lot of your debt covenants, as well as the balance sheet side of that change, which could affect your debt to equity ratio, which certainly increases your debt amount. Um, for other than financing leases, on the income statement side, um, you're still going to have that regular expense that is an operating expense, but there will be very few items that fall into this other than financing lease. And some of the things they put out there is that it is less than 12 months, so a very short time time frame was one of the criteria that they put out there previously. And I don't know what the remaining criteria will be for it to qualify as an other than finance lease. So certainly you're going to see that shift of grossing up the balance sheet where you did not have assets or liabilities before. It will change those uh, t uh, debt to equity ratios there. And you're going to see the movement of expenses out of operating expenses um, into more amortization and interest with those expenses being accelerated as they would be for any other debt instrument when you have more interest expense at the beginning than you do at the end. So hopefully that answers your question. Well, I think with that we are out of time. So I do see a couple other questions. If you have any questions and want to contact me directly, anything I haven't gotten to, please, please send me an email at uh, jsnyder at macpas.com. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, hopefully you enjoyed today's webcast, and I'll turn it back over to you, Reed. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on IFRS, brought to you by McConley and Asbury. As a reminder, you will be receiving CP credit for attending this one-hour webinar. CPE certifications will be sent out via email within the next week. You will be receiving a follow-up email to this webinar with a link to a short survey about the webinar that we would really appreciate your feedback on. We will be posting the slides from today's presentation on our blog at www.macpass.com slash manews. Look for that post to be up by the end of the day tomorrow. And just as a reminder, our next upcoming webinar will be on Becoming a Rainmaker, and that will be on Thursday, December 15th at 2 o'clock p.m., and you can sign up for that on our blog as well. Have a great afternoon.